This lecture is about British architecture um, between the wars. This era came out of the Edwardian period, which was very glamorous and confident. And this uh, painting here by John Singer Sargent shows the glamour and confidence of the time. And you can see this in things like the Colosseum, uh, where Machen, the architect, did this very glamorous interior with a lot of detail and ornament, and it's all very celebratory and confident and optimistic. The, the front facade of Buckingham Palace was built in 1913, just before the First World War. It would be unthinkable to design a building like that after the war. When the First World War happened, it really, starting with um, academics and the avant-garde, but really changed people's focus. The idea that a culture, um, a, society, a society, European society, could make millions of young men kill each other um, in northern France and elsewhere. Um, and the volume of people who died, it just made people understandably feel that there's something very wrong with, with traditional culture. Something has to be to blame. So it's the, is it the politics, the religion, the art? And very much um, avant-garde people of this period were, were looking around saying, look, we must um, you know, turn, turn the plug off of the wall and just start again. And so there was a reaction against traditionalism. It was in a way slow and it held on for a while, but throughout the period between the wars and then after the Second World War, developed into uh, modernism, which, which is the rejection of um, traditional culture. And it is completely understandable. Um, this really started actually before the First World War with uh, this character, uh, Marinetti. And he, he wrote, um, his, his basic idea was that we should free ourselves from the, um, the weight of the past. Uh, and he was, um, he was a fascist. Uh, close with Mussolini, and his uh, big interests were youth, strength, violence, uh, machinery, cars, aeroplanes, uh, industry, and um, he saw architecture as, uh, as traditional architecture uh, as kind of set in the past, always looking towards the past when we should always look towards the future. Uh, and his philosophy is very much summed up by, by this quote. I believe it necessary to suppress the adjective and the adverb because they constitute, taken together or individually, the multicoloured festoons, the trompe swags, pedestals, parapets and balustrades of the old traditional period. So he, he wanted to sort of strip away all of all of the columns and everything else, because he just felt this was holding us back from this glorious machine age where everyone would drive cars and mm, fly planes and whatever else. And part of his movement, the futurist movement, um, they produced art that was about speed and um, they employed the um, cubist technique to represent this, so it isn't the sort of static image that you get as a, in a traditional painting. It's chopped, you see things from different angles as if it's in movement. And then you have sculpture, which um, is all about movement as well. And the, it was a relatively short movement and there weren't really any futurist buildings as such built. But um, there were sort of schemes and they wanted buildings to look like uh, machinery rather than, you know, like, like cars, like um, uh, 
rather than like buildings that you'd recognise as being homely. Um, slightly later than him, um, that you had Adolf Luce, and he wrote a book called Ornament and Crime, and this is one of his buildings. And he felt that there was an inverse relationship between ornament and and the and civilization, I suppose. So, uh, basically, the argument is slightly racist argument um, that the more civilized you are, the more or the less ornament you need. So, uh, early primitive cultures, like um, he cites the Papuans, they will um, ornament everything they see. So they'll ornament their canoes, their houses, their oars, and they'll tattoo themselves. And he postulates that as we get more civilised, our, our need for ornament um, diminishes. In 1917, um, there was uh, the Russian Revolution. And this in a way is part of this wholesale rejection of traditional, well, traditional politics in this case, which um, coincided with the reject rejection of, of art. And contemporary with this is uh, Marcel Duchamp's urinal. And Duchamp in 1917 put a urinal in an art gallery as a um, in a way as a shocking statement about art and he called it the fountain and it was to say that all art of the past is in a way um, pointless and um, it, it's a kind of uh, the, the, the value that you put on Bernini and Canova and Michelangelo and the rest is holding us back. We're always looking back to these great people and it's all worthless and um, something like um, a urinal is equally valid as art. Um, and the um, famous Mona Lisa, he put a moustache on her and it's, it's a sort of deliberately saying these people are rubbish, forget them. Um, and uh, on top of that, these people are holding you back because traditional society gave us the First World War and you know, reject it and we need to find a new way of, of doing art and um, let's not keep doing the same thing we've done because then we're just going to end up with the same problems all over again. Immediately after the First World War these ideas were really for the avant-garde and the intellectuals, not, not for everyone. And um, it's interesting to look at um, First World War memorials where you still have very beautiful figurative sculpture and there, there's no sense that they have embraced these uh, revolutionary ideas of Marcel Duchamp uh, and others. And when it came to uh, designing the war graves for the First World War, uh, an architect called um, Sir Edwin Lutyens was employed he had had a very successful career going right back to the Victorian era where he started as an arts and crafts architect and then became more classical. And here you can see this arch here has a classical precedent. It's obviously got Lutyens' particular take on it, but it doesn't have the sort of revolutionary quality that we saw with um, Duchamp and Marinetti. And, um, there was in this period a kind of pared down classical architecture which seemed to be the popular style of the time. And uh, this is the cenotaph which Lutyens designed. And he's using things like cornices, um, base, base mouldings. It has a classical look but it isn't overtly um, in your face classicism. Um, and he also did this building um, in Finsbury Circus, which is actually quite an ornate classical building. So really, it was business as usual um, for the early part of the um, uh, post-war.
period. This is another um, building by Lutyens in the city, and it's a, a, a pretty conventional classical building. Admittedly, it has kind of Lutyens' take on classicism, but nonetheless, very, very classical. And you have uh, Bloomfield did uh, Regent Street in the 20s. And you have a very conventional take on classicism, admittedly on a massive scale, and using steel and other modern materials to allow it to all happen. Um, but very much continuing the architectural language before the war, fairly unaffected by the traumatic events of the First World War. Another interesting building of this period was Lutyens's Viceroy's house in New Delhi. And this is just interesting from a historical point of view. It was finished in the late 20s, having had a very long gestation period. And it was only in operation for a few decades before uh, India was given back to the Indians. So in a way, it's a if you had to have a building that defined the end of an era, I think uh, Lutyens Viceroy's house would be a good example. In architectural terms, it's very interesting, very characteristic of Lutyens. It has the kind of European classicism, but also he combines it with um, Indian architecture and something of his own personal style as well. In the early 20s, um, an architect called Le, Pou Le Corbusier, a, of Swiss origin, although kind of mainly French, um, wrote a book called Vers une architecture. And he, in a way, took the ideas of um, Marinetti and um, other avant-garde uh, modernists of the time and applied them to architecture. And in his book, he he encourages architects to look to um, ocean liners and uh, machinery as precedents for their buildings rather than um, the, the great buildings of Michelangelo and Palladio and so on. And here you can see uh, the front cover of his book has um, a walkway in an ocean liner to suggest this is how we should be thinking about architecture from a sort of functional point of view. Now that we've got new materials um, and now we live in a very different society, we need a completely different form of architecture. Having said that, he did, um, he did like quite a lot of classical architecture, particularly the ancient Greeks. He loved the simple forms of um, classical architecture. And here he is measuring a, a Greek temple. And he had an idea that architecture improves and refines over time. And so here you have a, a temp the temple at uh, Paestum, uh, 600, 600 BC. And then a few hundred years later, you have the Parthenon, which is a more refined version of the Paestum temple. The, the capitals are more refined, the, the um, pediments at a better pitch, um, and, and you can go on and on. And he suggests that this is the same as in car design, how an early car um, ha is later refined into um, the build, uh, the, this, this car of the 1920s contrasted with a, a car of 1907. Um, he, this is another page that's quite interesting. He liked the work of Michelangelo. He liked its strength and its, uh, the way that it it's casts shadows in light as a kind of almost like a, um, well, like a piece of sculpture. And what he didn't like was the overall Nate buildings of the Victorian era, which were kind of relentlessly capitals, um, uh, festoons, all of that. Similar, similar to the, um, the Marinetti problem with um, uh, architecture. 
when he looked at um, ancient work, uh, ancient architecture, or, or, um, or what he saw as good in architecture, was the use of um, platonic solids like um, spheres, uh, cubes, cylinders. And where you could get those into architecture, that was good architecture in his opinion. And this is a sketch of um, ancient Rome, and you have Castello Sant'Angelo, which is very easily read as a cube with a cylinder sitting on top. You've got the Colosseum, which is a stretched uh, cylinder and a pyramid. And uh, that to him was um, the essence of architecture on top of a functional approach um, like the cars and the, and the ocean liners. And he very much admired the grain stores of, um, of uh, North America and how they were built out of these simple platonic solids. And he wanted these to be used as um, a precedent for new architecture. And this chimes very much with his painting. He was a very keen painter and he painted a lot throughout his, his career. And he was essentially a cubist painter. And he integrated these simple platonic forms into his work. And his architecture, this is uh, Villa Savoie, which he designed in the late 20s. And it's very similar in that if you look at this top bit here, that could be a sculptural element from his picture. There's obviously a love of asymmetry, but you also have the platonic solids, these, this uh, cuboid shape of the building. Uh, with this is also, there's, and, and this is um, uh, very much part of his uh, psyche, is this kind of contempt for nature. He's not trying to be nestled in to nature like a cottage or something like that. He likes the building to sort of fly above nature. And that is a very, um, that comes through all his work. Um, this is uh, inside the, um, the villa, which it's all focused around a very small, rather <coughs> unappealing courtyard. And he's using the language of ocean liners uh, and functionalism as part of his design. Um, and here's another, another building, uh, another house he did. And it is, it, everything has to be rethought. And it's like, um, he doesn't want to say, I've looked at cottages and I'm developing something from that. It's, I'm chucking away everything. I'm trying to see everything like I've come from outer space and um, just see it in terms of function. If we need a, a, a wide window, let's do a wide window. It doesn't matter, it's never been done. In fact, that's a good thing that it's never been done before. Um, and he was the first architect of note to um, suggest living in high-rise towers. And this was a sort of dream of his. Again, similar to the Marinetti, I did this, this love affair with cars and technology. And he thought, and, and trying to understand him in a way that you have all these slums in uh, all the city, most cities in, in Europe. And the idea that you could house, it, it would be you know, normal people and the poor and whatever else, in these massive towers um, where they would be able to see the sky, they'd be away from the ground, uh, they'd be divorced from nature, um, because it, in a way kind of nature is sort of traditionalism, nature is death, and it was, it was living this wonderful abstract life. And this is one of his um, ideas, and um, this is in for the middle of Paris. So this is, the, um, this is where Notre Dame is, and this is the Seine running around like here, uh, and this is just north of Notre Dame in the Marais, which is one of the most beautiful and historic and most interesting parts of Paris. And he suggested knocking the whole lot down and building these series of towers with roads between. Uh, an absolute nightmare, and it's, it's so uh, wonderful it didn't happen. But he felt it was it, he, the, the thing to do. Um, these ideas of Le Corbusier 
um, slowly filtered um, into uh, British architecture. And um, this is a, a tube station of the 30s. And it's, he's, they're using platonic solids. Admittedly, it's got a cornice. And so it has a kind of classical precedent, but uh, also a, a modernist look. And in a way, um, British architecture of this period they, they were sort of riding two horses. It was both classical on the one hand and also, and also modernist. And there wasn't this sort of antagonism between the two, which, which later occurred a, a, as they divided off on their own way. Uh, this is um, another uh, tube station, which, um, again, a platonic cylinder, but with a cornice, and you can see little medallions underneath. So, again, riding both horses of classicism and modernism. And things like the RIBA building, which was built in the 1930s, this has this um, classical and modern look. And at this time, you also have the Art Deco period, which, um, uh, which in a way is this pared down classicism with a certain influence of um, ocean liners and the sort of simplicity of, of that. Uh, but you could read this as a, as a classical building in that you've got a rusticated basement and you've got a piano nobile with a, um, a big first floor. But in other ways, it's, and, and you've got a cornice along the top. So it is, it is definitely both. But there is a kind of modernist look to it, like you have these empty planes here. There's something very modernist about the shape of that uh, opening. This uh, tower was the first high-rise building to be built in London in the late, uh, late 20s. And here you can see we've still got vertical windows, like a, a, um, a Georgian or classical building. You've got a few balustrades. You've got vestiges of um, entablatures and like an attic story. So it, it, it does share the, the classical language, but in a pared down, slightly modernist way. Um, this is the tower um, for um, UCL, uh, the um, University College London. It's a very Art Deco style building, um, classical of sorts. Uh, he's obviously using uh, modern um, steel steelwork construction to get it to this height. It, again, it can be read, read as both classical and modern at the same time. You've then got buildings like the Hoover Building, which has, um, uh, it does have precedence, but they, they are the kind of choice of the Art Deco movement. So it's more sort of uh, Egyptian style rather than um, Palladian or French. Um, while all of this is going on, um, all this interest in modernism and Art Deco and so on, uh, strangely enough, um, most of the actual building being done, particularly as you get towards the Second World War, were these very traditional houses um, which often have Tudor elements in them. And um, this kind of development was really being built throughout the interwar period. And there's something about houses that people seem to very often like them to have a kind of traditional flavor. So these have things like tile hanging and half timbered as if they're Tudor. Um, so in a way, the, the the latest theories of modernism and Le Corbusier and everything else really hardly touched um, British architecture. Um, it was more generally this sort of work. Just before the war, there was an ongoing project, uh, which was the building of Liverpool Cathedral by Lutyens again. And this was going to be absolutely colossal. And um, Lutyens, uh, started the basement, um, and I, I mean I, I sort of put this in to show that classical architecture was very far from dead in um, right up until the Second World War. 
um, because this was, this was hugely ambitious. And you can just see this little piece here was, um, is here. So they started the basement and they finished that. Um, and then the war happened. And um, just, uh, just for a point of interest, the, the, um, in America, classical architecture was going great guns in the 40s. This was uh, by um, Pope, an architect called Pope, who did some work in England as well. And um, it's the monument for Jefferson. And it's a colossal classical building, very straight, simple, well, actually pretty ornate classicism. And um, as if modernism hadn't happened, admittedly they were doing things in New York that were different, but for these, um, in, in um, Washington DC, there was a whole load of buildings built in the 30s and 40s um, around the Mall, which were very, academic, very pure classical buildings. Uh, then uh, the war happened and that really changed, changed everything. And I think the ideas I was talking about earlier about the First World War, um, where people felt they just had to um, change culture because we just don't want this to happen again and uh, a kind of rejection of traditionalism. Um, that really happened um, it, for, in British architecture at the end of the war. Like, like a switch, um, there really is virtually no modernist architecture in England pre, um, pre the war. I mean, there's one or two examples, literally one or two. Um, and then, and it's all traditional, classical. And then after the war, it's all modern with very few traditional examples. Um, and I think this is, this is actually partly to do with the attitude that uh, British people had to modernism. Um, this an interesting slide here. This is Warsaw just after the war, absolutely decimated. What they did is they just rebuilt it as it was. Um, but unfortunately, this didn't happen um, in uh, England. We, we were very much in love with modernism. It was seen as this great solution to um, culture and this wasn't just the avant-garde and a few um, eccentrics believing this. This, was, this really w was a, a lot of people were starting to think this way. So when beautiful Georgian and Victorian terraces were smashed down um, because of bombing. This was the sort of thing that w it was uh, replaced by uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and when it came to uh, religious architecture, instead of the work of Lutchens, um, which we saw earlier on, they were doing buildings like this, which were overtly modernist. Uh, this is a, a picture of my father's partner, Raymond Deerith, and one of uh, a building that he, he designed in the 1930s. And he, he was very conscious of this switch that just went. And he had a very, six, well, he, he was very young before the war, but it looked like he would be the new um, classical architect of, of the um, post-war era, or he felt he would be. And he, he just, uh, to him, uh, modernism um, before the war, it's just a few eccentrics. It's all probably, it's, it's nothing to, uh, not, it won't affect anything. And then he just found he was like a fish out of water when the, um, uh, after the Second World War. And he, he continued doing classical architecture in a very minor way, but um, it really was um, not respected at all. And things like the, um, the Festival of Britain, was uh, an example of how, uh, how much modernism was, was loved. Th this was, all these buildings were, there's no reference to traditional buildings. They don't want any reference to it. It's um, the wars ended. We've got a lot of people to house. 
Um, let's forget about all those ideas and do something really new and modern and of our age. And you have people like Henry Moore coming to um, prominence uh, as a sculptor. Um, no longer do we have the um, very beautiful First World War period sculptures. It's far more uh, cubist uh, and modernist based. And this is the, um, um, the Festival Hall, uh, which um, was part of, the, um, part of the Festival of Britain's site. Very modernist, these very plain sides, no cornices. It has a little reference to Corbus Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie with the columns below um, and this very uh, never seen before style in a way. Um, and Le Corbusier's ideas on uh, urbanism were also um, taken hook, line and sinker by British architects. And so when all the, um, the war sites were, were rebuilt, um, they were so keen on the architects, really, were so keen, keen on these towers that they smashed down perfectly okay Georgian terraces, Georgian and Victorian terraces, to build these hideous um, towers. Very often the people living in these towers were completely happy with their Georgian and Victorian terraces, and it was a decision made by um, professionals, um, which they had very little say in, and um, they were very upset because a Georgian terrace, uh, they, they, there's a kind of, the street has so many, gener been, it's been with us for millennia and living in towers is, is something we didn't know how to do. And um, here we are, lots of architects in ties and suits deciding what sort of building people should have with very little consent. And um, here's the, the result. And I think everyone knows the, the, the problem with these towers and everyone says, oh, we should never do this again. You know, people urinate in the lifts and what happens if you're a mother trying to bring up children, you always have to make sure that they're safe and the a myriad of, of, of problems. And I think really the problem is that the modern movement grew out of the avant-garde. And the avant-garde's absolutely fine when it comes to, say, music or painting or literature. Um, with a book, you can just not read it. With a music, you, you don't have to listen to it. Painting, just don't buy it, don't put it on the wall. But architecture, it's, it's an art for everyone. And it's a real problem that, um, uh, that you, you can't just have interesting avant-garde ideas because it's, it's completely different. And um, you can't, with, with a building, you can't, uh, you can't switch it off um, like a, a piece of music or um, a, a painting which you choose to hang or not. It is, it is for everyone and it has to work um, incredibly well. And I, I think, I feel that the whole business of throwing everything out and rethinking them um, obviously really didn't suit architecture at all.